Go ahead. Get it out of your system. I already know what's coming. I already know what's coming. Just go ahead and get it. Get it out of your system. Get it out of your system. Just go ahead. Let's go. Yep. Let's go. There we go. Now it's starting to come in. Yep. Guys, we're here for Laser Pig. We're also here for Boomer, Boomer Moments. Um, that is what we're here for. How's everybody doing? Yeah, just get it out of your system, guys. Get it out of your system. It's just... It's okay. Go right ahead. Oh, boy. I thought I turned that microphone back on, but evidently not. Today, guys, we're going to be checking out a Laser Pig video. This is why the T-14 Armatura sucks. And if you... And the thing about it is, guys, one thing to really know about me is I really don't know that much about tanks. I love when I learn things that I don't know. But at the same time, guys, I have told you guys on several occasions, do not expect me to be sitting there giving you guys like the, the big lowdown about any kind of like tank or anything like that. This was requested by the Screaming Midget. And as soon as I saw it was laser pick, I was like, okay, let's just roll right into it because I know I'm going to enjoy this. Now, I've heard there's a little bit of controversy around this video. I don't know what about, but that's neither here nor there. Slacker, you're trying to find some videos to counter for the heresy tomorrow? Nice. Hey, Racer Z, what's up, bud? Thanks. Guys, tomorrow I'm thinking about doing a longer stream than I normally do because I'm going on vacation as of tomorrow. I will be on vacation, actual vacation this time, for the first time in literal years. I'm taking a, you know, time away from work where I go off and, you know, do things that I want to really, like, really want to have wanted to do. Um, so I'm going to be doing, some, I'm going to be doing a lot of fishing over the next week. Um, on Saturday, I do have to drive uh, about 12 hours, so it's going to be a long day. Friday and Saturday, you might not see me that much outside. I'm I'm going to be doing I'm going to be doing two live streams. One of which, of course, is going to be the shenanigans uh, shenanigans, of course, and I will be doing another live stream on Saturday night. Depending on when I get home is going to be depending on what is played. Driving a long distance really becomes painful for me. Um, my joints really don't like it that much. It's just that you know. It is what it is, guys. And you think if I had driven, you think enough times of me driving across the country, I would have gotten used to that, but it still hurts like hell. But what's a vacation? That's a rich people food? Dude, I haven't taken one in years. And I mean absolute years. It's been a thing. It's been an absolute thing. The controversy is the most non controversial controversy ever. Literally nothing sandwich arguments. Well, then I guess it's stupid. Catch a bass. I'm going to be looking for walleye and catfish. That's what I'm going to be looking for. Oh, right. X in chat if you're ready for the pig man. You at a beach in a bikini. You're making my dreams go wild. Uncle Sup, why did you do this to my mental health? I just... Why did you do this to my mental health? That wasn't correct. It just, I'm just going to turn it on now and be sad. Here we go. Our good boy, Laser Pig. Ducks. World of Warships. In 2015, the Russian military did something it had never done before. It built something new. Finally, the Russian army would no longer just throw more crap onto the T-72 and claim it was better because they'd made the number bigger. No, <laughs> this time they'd actually done the impossible. They'd somehow managed to build and design a whole new tank. And this time it wasn't just a T-80 with an extra road wheel and a bunch of cardboard bits attached to the side. No, sir, this was real. They even had multiple of them and everything. And I'm getting dizzy. They moved. 
this was real. It was actually going to be produced. So rise to your feet, every pony, and charge your glasses. For in 2015, finally, we welcome Drosha into the dawn of the 21st. Is anybody else getting dizzy? century of combat. No longer would Russia be shackled to its old Soviet image, strapping more and more funny armor boxes onto vehicles half a century old. Which no, was sir, this was a modern vehicle built to compete with the very latest of modern Western armor, and this okay. was just the beginning. Soon fleets of new vehicles, guns, and warships. Why are they spinning so much? I'm getting sick here would propel Russia into the ranks of one, if not the most elite and advanced fighting forces in the world. So you must be asking yourself, what the fuck happened? <laughs> but first... <laughs> <laughs> Add time. Tell me about World of Warships. Do it, pig. I see her. But I'm a pig in the rain. Oh. Just a pig. Oh. Or perhaps a man. Oh. And she is a beauty. Oh. Or perhaps a horse. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but she is a 50,000 ton warship. She is love. She is pillars of mountainless love. And I am but down here in the cold and the unforgiven. But I am inspiring. I am strong. I am. A pig in the rain. <laughs> the pig is more than just a pig. It is one with the universe. It is the defining dynasty of our life. It is true passion. Okay. World of Warships. A new fragrance by Wargaming. <laughs> so, what do you think? Okay, what was that? <laughs> Well, that, that was art. Yes. No, that was supposed to be an ad for World of Warships. All you had to do was tell people that it's a free-to-play naval PvP shooter game available on PC. Uh -huh. Not win a Sundance Award. <laughs> you just don't understand my vision. Vision? This is World of Warships, a game where you battle with hundreds of historically accurate warships in large-scale 12v12 PvP arenas. It's not about your poor, tortured, artistic soul. Try again. This time, make it appeal to a more general audience. Do it. Fight! All right, Donna. How you doing, hen? <laughs> all right, Jackie. I'm all right. Except I've got a wee bit of a problem, you know, in my downstairs area. I used to have a wee bit of a problem in my downstairs area as well, but I got rid of it. Ah, but Jackie, your skin's always so soft, and you never have problems. What's your secret? You know my secret, Donna. I use New World of Warships, the best way to start the day. What was that? <laughs> to make it more appealing. <laughs> to a general audience. And you interpreted that as suggesting World of Warships as a cure for thrush. Look, I, I was just trying to. I don't <laughs> care what you were trying to do. This is World of Warships, a game with top-notch graphics, over 40 unique maps, and a dynamic weather system with new content released every month. It's an amazingly simple concept to get across to people. You yes, like our pig ships. boy does you good like ass. You like explosions, World of Warships. Try again! Ah, oh, fine. Come on, pig. Ah, uh, yes. World of Warships. The best free-to-play naval-based arena PvP RPG featuring hundreds of your favorite- Wait. Who is that? Uh, <laughs> my stunt double? I- I am a highly respected craftsman of the YouTube meme history and critique world, and I am not your stunt double. And I ordered a Choco Loco Macchiato Cappuccino an hour ago, which I still haven't received. And the anime femboy supplied to my changing room was subpar. I was promised A grade maximum gay. You got the Little Caesars pizza you asked for. And? It's supposed to come with free crayons. How am I supposed to express myself artistically under these conditions? You know what? Sumato out. 
<laughs> okay, okay, okay. You know what? I, I have a No one does ads like the pig boy. Other ideas. Okay. She was just an ordinary Oh girl. my god. He was a 50,000 ton warship. But their love spanned the oceans. Coming this summer. No! Just... No. But, but, but I... Look, just... Just run around and scream like you normally do. <laughs> oh, fine. World of Warships! Yeah! The best high octane written tooty punty shooty clicky clicky naval exploding game there is, and it's free! Use code LaserPig for free stuff! <laughs> what free stuff? This free stuff! Here's footage of me actually playing the game as the best nation, Italy! You have oh, God, no. your last beer! Play with friends, play alone, click the link in the description to play with millions of players. I don't know. Whining on the subreddit because they got sunk by a submarine. Submarines are so OP, guys. I'm deleting this game. Ah, <laughs> oh, my pearls. Ah. Hang on, let me check the brief and see if I got everything I'm supposed to okay. say. Okay. <laughs> yep, we're good. World of Warships, they pay my rent. There you go. Anyway, back to the video. When the T-14 was unveiled, everyone and their mother in the military community pissed themselves like a frightened horse, and immediately the knuckle-dragging tank experts of the internet started huffing balls in an effort to tell us how obsolete this one new tank made everything else that came before it. It's invincible! It's the most powerful tank in the galaxy! Okay. All of the NATO nations are wetting themselves over it! Nothing can compare to the T-14 Armata! <laughs> <clears throat> and then slowly reality sat in. Okay. The T-14 combines all the ultimate and Russian technology previously introduced onto NATO tanks 25 years ago. In Lovely. a way that only a country trying to inflate the share prices of Raytheon would understand. It does away with all the unnecessary ERA systems of the T-90, which cannot protect the tank against missiles that were invented in the 80s, and instead replaces them with an active protection system that can almost defend the tank against missiles that were invented in the 90s. Yay! Finally! It features a fully automated turret, a first-generation touchscreen that the commander has to claw at like a shut-in teenager desperately trying to find porn on the family computer before his mum gets back from shopping, an autoloader famous for jamming that now cannot be accessed and cleared when it does jam, is somehow heavier and slower than the tank it has replaced, and comes combined together in a package so expensive the company that made it immediately went bankrupt, the country <laughs> that bought it cannot afford it, and it has about as much export potential as English whiskey. <laughs> oh dear. But for a while, every idiot with even the vaguest sense of military interest was banging on about this tank as if Stalin had come back to life and had personally forged the hull from his own ball sack, and that all tanks across every nation in the world had just been rendered obsolete. But honestly, the T-14 is, and remains, about as threatening as a 12-year-old proclaiming his sexual prowess over your various relatives. And thankfully, due to recent okay. events, the wailing morons that once inhabited the internet and propped up that Russia-strong culture that we don't like to talk about, but it did exist, have either slowly changed their mind when Putin finally played his 5D chess and it turned out he'd been playing 5D snakes and ladders the whole time, or uh -huh. descended down into the rabbit hole and gone full Vatnik, which are a group of people I like to file under the category of easily ignored. But hey, if you want to take advice from someone who gets all their information from a news broadcasting service where they literally arrest you for not agreeing with the government, that's up to you. Remember, it's not propaganda if you agree with it, because how could you be wrong? You're intelligent, and you thought about it really, really hard. I know, Not right? Not like those other sheep, am I right? So Putin was supposed to have about 1,500 of these T-14s by the end of 2021. Why does it spin so much? He ended up with 24. In fact, he may have even less. Keep in mind, with Russia, this is a country that, during parades, drove their nuke. I'll try spinning! That's a good trick! This thing's making me sick just watching it around the block, painted extra numbers on them, and then drove them back to the start of the parade to make them look like they had more. Lovely. The rule of thumb with Russia is, if you don't see it, they don't have it. We've seen eight T-14s. They have eight T-14s. Supposedly, they made their combat debut in Syria, which happens to be the most filmed and documented war in living history, and yet we saw absolutely zero footage of any T-14s in action. Rule of thumb, 
There were never any in Syria. Lovely. In fact, in spite of every major news outlet proclaiming that the T-14s are on the way to Ukraine and may already be there, oh, shock, horror, I'd be willing to bet that no T-14 is currently in service outside of the 14th Guards Armoured Parade Division, who have recently okay. undergone their latest modern update program by upgrading their old logo to this new one from the 1990s Microsoft Clip Art Collection. Nice! Quite frankly, the T-14 is not the tank people think it is. It is not the final word in armoured warfare. It is not the most modern battle tank ever created that renders everything that came before it completely obsolete. It's nothing more than a fat old Russian sacred cow. And I want to explain why. Lovely. Let's go. <laughs> oh no! A lot of people, when they think of the T-14, will tell you its design roots begin with the T-95, in that it was the first tank Russia designed after the fall of the Soviet Union. Since it was no longer constrained by Soviet ideology in battle, the Russians could basically build whatever they wanted. And immediately they went about abandoning the philosophy of the T-72 and its ridiculous carousel autoloader, the system which has produced some of Russia's greatest memes, and instead incorporated a more French-style cartridge autoloading system, featuring a rear ammunition compartment complete with blowout panels to protect the crew. Not only hey! Would this new auto-loading system allow the T-95 to fire considerably faster than the T-90, it would also allow it to fire the more powerful and more modern shells that, to this day, the T-90 still cannot use. It would also feature a okay. crewless turret with the crew safely contained in an armoured box and a 30mm autocannon built to allow the tank to take on lightly armoured vehicles without having to fire the main gun. Okay. All in all, the T-95 was shaping up to be a real leap forward for Russia, both in terms of technology and military thinking. And though the tank promised a lot, everything it promised was within reason, mm -hmm. and had it been developed, it probably would have posed a real rival to the more modern western tanks we know and love today. There was just one... Tiny, tiny. The melee attack of the Bane Blade is a spin attack. Why? Any problem. It was being built in 90s Russia. For those oh, of you who don't yeah. know, 90s Russia had somewhere between zero and absolutely nothing in their budget. Right. The tank programs are famously very expensive. In 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed, and with it, Russia lost its empire, which up till then had accounted for about half its population and around 60% of its GDP. Uh -huh. Its overbloated military budget was largely to blame for its economic collapse, so naturally this was the first thing that had to go, leading to an almost total disarray of its army. But don't worry, guys, the Russian bear is not being declawed yet. No, it just sit, exported its claws to uh, countries in Africa so they could basically, yeah, now you find the AK-47 everywhere. It was a really good idea. Russia may be down, but we're not out yet, which is why they charged into the 1994 Chechnyan War. A war that went so badly for them, it has been cited as one of the most embarrassing defeats in the history of the Russian army. Yep. Well, it was, at any rate. Have the, yeah, this is... Uh... God, I remember this stuff on the news, and everybody was sitting there like, while we're like, people would come, like I would hear adults talking because this happened when I was still a kid. Like, why were we worried about these guys again? Like, why were we worried about these guys? Having suffered a defeat at the hands of what was essentially local militia, Russia needed to look like this was just a fluke, and it was well on its way to reforming a new, far more powerful, far more modern army. It needed the world to believe that that great Russian bear was alive and well. So yeah. suddenly, without warning, comes the T-95. The tank was shown at the Omnisk Arms Convention in 1997. Now, new tank projects are rare, and when one is announced it can cause quite a stir in the military enthusiast community. So you can bet your ass everyone was huffing balls over the T-95. 95, especially because this was back in the 90s and really no one was really doing anything. But if you had a time machine and went back in time to see the T-95 in action, prepare to be disappointed. Uh -huh. The tank was kept as far away as physically possible from the crowds and observation platforms. It was covered in camouflage netting and did nothing more than drive around for a bit before being taken away. <laughs> it would only ever be seen once more in a 1999 arms convention in Siberia, where it would drive around this time a little faster and even pause for a photo op, but nice. spent most of its time hidden under a tarp. And there was a specific reason for that. See, the thing is, the T-95 
never existed. In 2009, it was revealed by one Colonel Vladimir Voitov, who had apparently been in charge of the project, that the whole thing was never real. The T-95 shown was in actuality a prototype for an elongated T-80 tank that had been built in the 1980s but had never gone anywhere. Is all this true? The Object 640 was upgraded T-80 with a new turret and bustle all over. The Object 195 is a brand new tank. The Armada is the Object 187 was designed using principles from the Object 195. Dude, this is this is like hurting my feelings. This is really hurting my feelings. It's funny as hell, but it's painful nonetheless. This would later become recycled into something called the Black Eagle Project, uh -huh. an upgrade package for the T-80, which also never went anywhere. Lovely. The Black Eagle, wow, such an amazing, badass name. You gotta love it. I mean, it sounds like a shit Marvel superhero, but <laughs> don't you just want to get into its pants? Anyway, no. The 1997 T-95 had a wooden mock-up turret with nothing inside it, and the 1999 version actually had a working turret installed, but again, there was nothing inside it. No radio, no ammunition, no autoloader, and the gun was just a wooden mock-up. And even in this configuration, the tank proved to be so unstable, its time on the proving ground was cut short. Lovely. The T-95 was nothing short of a propaganda piece, something for the cameras and the Vatniks to swoon over. It was there to prove what Russia was capable of, that it still had t and it was not to be underestimated that it could still run with the big boys and challenge their western designs. But all it really proved that was short of an economic miracle, Russia was going to be relying on that old Soviet stockpile a little while longer. Wish Cut forward to the are. 2022 Ukraine invasion and that's exactly what happened. But this video is not about Ukraine. It's about the T-14 Armata, because a lot of you might be saying, well, if this tank is so advanced and Russia is so desperate, then why is it not on the front lines? I mean, wouldn't that make sense? Right. I mean, Ukraine's anti-tank policy is largely mine-focused. Yes, they have a lot of manned portable launchers, but these are mostly things like the Javelin, which are the exact munitions the T-14 was designed to beat. So surely this would be the best weapon for them to have. Of course! Right? Well, this is where it starts to get just a little bit complicated. Okay. The failure of the T-95 to get anywhere outside of a vodka-infused dream meant that Russia had to fall back onto its older Soviet models. Now these models are all, you know, they're all okay, but they all share a singular common feature. Uh -huh. The engine. With the exception of the T-64 and some models of the T-80, every Russian tank and BMP has used the same engine, a modification of the Kharkiv Model V-2, the same engine used on the Soviet Second World War era BT-7, though it's more famously for being used in the T-34 and KV series of tanks. Okay. And it's the same engine that is being used in the latest models of the T-90, giving it the classic title of the Kalashnikovs of engines, and promoting anyone over the age of 37 to immediately state, well, if there ain't broke, don't fix it, and then act like that's an intelligent thing to say. <laughs> like we should be scared of innovation or something. I mean, the Nokia 3310 still works, but you don't have that, do you? Uh, mm -hmm. Nothing can stop a Nokia from working. You can launch that thing into the. You can launch that thing into the sun, and it'll pick up a call on the other side. Okay. You have an iPhone. I mean, why? Did your 3310 broke, or is it because there's nothing really wrong with just wanting to make things better, and that some of our greatest inventions, which you probably use every day, came about from someone just taking a regular thing and making it better? Or are you going to give up your car and go live with the Amish because there's nothing wrong with the horse and cart? It never broke, so don't fix it. Try thinking before you speak next time. The problem with the V2, while it's still fairly reliable and is an engine that do what engines do, it is, at its core, a design that is 84 years old. The design of diesel engines has dramatically changed and improved since 1937, to True. the point where the Western domestic market has overtaken the Russian military market. If you've got a few thousand dollars in your back pocket, you can go out to America today and buy a better engine than what is equipped in the most latest and most modern of Russian main battle tanks. Lovely. The V2, while it still works, is extremely extremely bulky, extremely heavy, and incredibly archaic in its design. And though it weighs the same as the Abrams ATG-1500 gas turbine engines, with both being slightly over one ton in weight, the Abrams can push the 52-ton tank up to 42 miles an hour. The T-90, in spite of being almost 10 tons lighter, can only move at a top speed of 32 miles per hour. Okay. Oh dear. 
The engine of the T-90 is also extremely loud, much louder than that of the Abrams, which if you've ever stood next to one, you'll know why they call it the Whispering Death. It's also extremely thirsty, not just for fuel, but for oxygen, making it prone to overheating and burning out at high altitude, which became a huge problem for India when it found its T-90s kept breaking down in the mountainous regions between it and China, uh -huh. which meant during many of its border skirmishes with China, a lot of its troops lacked urgent tank support, which led to India restarting its previously cancelled in-house tank comedy program, the Arjun. In short, as a tank, the T-90 should be one of the fastest main battle tanks out there. In reality, it's just as fast as the British Challenger 2, a tank which weighs 20 tons heavier than it. 20 tons heavier. It also features uh -huh. a comedic list of transmission problems, cooling issues, and of course, it famously can't reverse. All of this means if Russia is going to produce a modern tank capable of surpassing Western designs, it's going to need a better engine. It can't reverse? That's a... What? And this is where the true problems for Russia begin. Okay, tell me. They got the mustard out. They got the mustard By now, it's the 2000s. It's the new millennium. Yay! London's built a big dome, everything's white with black trim, and corners are out. This is true. This was the thing. This is the thing. Smooth as the new cool. And oh my god. Who greenlights a tent that can't reverse? Apparently Russia. What could be more cool than Russia's smooth-headed new president, Vladimir Putin? Putin launches his new president. No. No. Both of them. Like, why do they look like before and after pictures from the same commercial? Just, just a question. Presidency with a new Boris Yeltsin looks so, like, he looks so pinched in this. New war, it's back to Chechnya. This Yay. time, Chechnya's an ex, but it would take them seven years and at a cost of 12,000 of its own soldiers. The war showed that while changes had been made, the Russian army was still a shadow of its former power. Right. In response, Putin announces a series of changes to the Russian military, hailing it as the single greatest military reform in the world. And while the promise of new equipment and better streamlined training bore the focus, Focus. In reality, the reforms were largely about reducing the army's size, cutting the number of officers down by 61%, and the number of training skills from 65 to 10. And there's a reason for that. Putin's greatest fear is that a political hero figure will one day rise up through the ranks to challenge him for the presidency. And the place this was most likely to come from was the army. He knew no matter how many knives glinted in the darkness behind him, no one would dare be the first to strike if there was no one powerful enough to replace him. And this included the West. So through these reforms, the army became something young people did to earn merits to secure better jobs and university places. Anyone who remained in the army was typically seen as someone who couldn't advance beyond it, who wasn't capable of doing anything better. For context, think of how society treats a typical McDonald's employee. Uh. Officer promotions were handed out based on loyalty rather than ability, stockpiles became shopping markets for scrap metal merchants and arms dealers, and logistics was taken away from the military and reformed into a civilian branch. It's You can't do that. So one of the things that happened during during the war the, the ukraine war the first the first thing that i noticed was my god they're moving slow like they should just literally be tidal waving over this right now like over everything their face is supposed to be the best that russia has versus this, essentially the um national guard's drunken brother in ukraine and they were getting pasted and it's because their logistics was so absolutely piss poor. It was a joke. You you can't... To run an effective military, you can't ignore the logistics. The logistics... Lo, it's logistics! What the hell? Drinks filled by mafia members who would turn a blind eye to the theft and sale of equipment. Lovely. If you want to know the result of that, look away now. Yep. But Putin had made one 
major mistake. While this kind of system helped reduce the potential of anyone competent in his army rising high enough to challenge him, it meant his military also became a breeding ground for the lazy and the incompetent. And this would be proven in the 2014 invasion of Ukraine. Politically, the 2014 invasion of Ukraine is a masterpiece. It left the Western nations dumbfounded and slow to react, the Western press arguing over who to support, and legions of military nerds giggling at how badass Putin was. But the actual ground campaign did not go over smoothly. No, Ukraine's didn't. army was tiny, badly trained, highly demotivated, with just a handful of working tanks and almost no logistics to speak of. And though Russia was able to take Crimea, its longer term objectives to rob Ukraine of its entire coastline, taking Odessa and Maripol failed dramatically. Ukraine was able to recapture most of its territory and retake control of the border. And what was worse, its elite troops in the south of Ukraine had been repelled outside of Maripol by an armed militia known as the Azov Legion. This humiliation is often why you see so much anti-Azov propaganda. Now, Putin mm. was not stupid. He knew his army was largely incapable and had banked on lightning fast attacks which could overwhelm Ukraine before it could react. He had pinned his hopes on his elite units of the VDV and the First Guards Armoured, as well as his own personal army, the PMC Wagner Group, believing that their heroic reputation alone would be enough to spare these units the worst of the corruption. Wow. Those thoughts didn't age well. My God. Ugh. You want to talk about you want to talk about a, an unfortunate when I can tell you guys when that when 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 Wagner's group turned and started marching towards Moscow, I was like, "This is the that this is the last thing, the absolute last thing that we need to have happen here." Because, oh my god, this is going to be an absolute tragedy. It's just so insane. Oh, uh, yeah, logistics is a pain. It's why America has bases everywhere where we already have a lot of logistics. It's literally the only two reasons other than being a forward beachhead. Yes! You have to have... I'm going to stop talking about logistics. The sheer fact that Russia didn't prioritize logistics is the reason they're an embarrassment right now. But he was wrong. The VDV and Wagner's performance was somewhat lackluster. Ukraine had organized itself a lot faster than expected, and by the time Russian troops were ready to try again, British, American, and French troops were massing on the borders of Estonia. Once again, the Russian army had proved itself incapable. The image of the great Russian bear was waning. And though the great propaganda machine rolled without much challenge, and the average Western armchair warlord would believe this was a Russian victory, the experts were watching with concerned expression. Russia had taken 8,000 losses, losses it should never have statistically taken. So at the end of 2014, Putin would launch yet another series of great reforms. He would attempt to bolster the power and the reputation of Russia's more elite divisions, reactivating a number of older divisions from Soviet times, and placing an emphasis that new equipment and more specialist training was to be reserved for them, believing that the title of guards, as well as the positions of pride and parades, would promote a more professional attitude among its members. Mm. And pride of this new reformed Russian army was the new T-14, a family of vehicles based on the new tank chassis, which okay. would include IFVs and support vehicles. But by then, the damage was already done. As mentioned earlier, the concept of a new Russian tank would mean having to finally can the V2 engine. Western engines had drastically greater power to weight ratios, and if this new tank was going to incorporate all the new systems a tank needed, as well as remain both mobile enough and low profile enough to suit the demands of Russian war planning, Russia would need an entire new engine to suit this new tank. Okay. One that was modern, lightweight, yet powerful enough to drive the tank's final projected weight of 50 tons. Okay. There was just one slight problem. Such an engine didn't exist. Now, Euro Van <laughs> Now, Euro were the people behind the T14 Armata project, and in their brilliance, they could only possibly come to a bunch of people high on mountain air and vodka, decided just to copy the German SLA 16. You know, the engine from the Second World War Nazi tank, the Porsche Tiger the famously unreliable. The reason they went with this engine is because Russia didn't want to rely on Western imports before building a tank that relied almost entirely on Western imports. 
what was going on in these people's heads? It might have also been because a considerable number of them had been captured by the advancing Red Army during the Second World War. There had been considerable studies of the engine and a Russian modified version of it now existed, which was the version of the engine Ural had chosen. The problem was, this version of the engine they wanted, the A85-3, had been built to power oil compressing and pumping stations not heavy vehicles. The engine had been a complete commercial failure. No one wanted it because, surprise, surprise, it was unreliable. But you Tell me this ain't right. Tell me this ain't right. This is so stupid. T tell me this is not correct. This is so dumb. Oh, baby Jesus, we need to pray for these people. Oh my God, this is the dumbest thing I have heard yet. Oh my God, it's true. Why? Like, seriously. It happened 80 years ago. And not one of you motherfuckers sat down with a paper and pen and thought to draw up a better engine? Oh my God. Oh my god, my brain hurts. Oh, this... Okay, let, let's go. Ural looked upon this unreliable, modified, commercial failure of a pumping engine, ripped out of a Second World War German tank famed for breaking down constantly, and thought, yes, from this engine, we shall build a new Russian tank. And so it began. Okay. The T-14 was built around the engine. This would have been fine, had the engine been any good. Ural, for reasons only known to them, believed they could fix any problems along the way, and accepted huge government contracts to produce the new vehicle. But there was another problem. Okay. It's called Brain Drain. And no, it's not a 60s horror flick. Look, let me give you an example. Congratulations, you've been born in Russia. <laughs> You're now a proud member of the greatest country in the world, according to them. You've gone through all the mandatory 18-year wait period, gotten into university, and now passed with your groovy new qualification in engineering. So what do you do with your life? I mean, you could stay in Russia and live in a home like this and earn roughly $14,000 a year, or you could move to America, where you could live in a home like this, earn sixty dollars to $80,000 a year, rising to $120,000 depending on experience and industry sector. You see where this is going. Brain drain is the expression given to the problem of young intelligent people choosing to work or study in foreign countries where the pay and quality of life are vastly greater. In Russia, the long-term strategy, where funds were never diverted into making life better for the average worker, uh -huh. means most people outside of a specific few live lives comparable to England in the 1970s. Now, many, most notably people who don't live in Russia, claim it's a culture thing, as <laughs> luxury is just not a priority to the average Russian. And within Russia, there, yeah, there does exist a certain degree of an almost toxic masculinity culture where impoverished life and hardship is worshipped as being I love the fact he gets in front of the camera with a black eye and starts doing whatever this is called with the Adidas tracksuit. That's amazing. Being manly. But Russians are still human. Give a Russian a mansion and he will turn it into a Slavic slum to prove how much of a man he is. He okay. will just start living a more comfortable life. And if you take it away from him, he will naturally get angry and want it back, as would anyone. The pre-war economic boom of modern-day Russia created fairly wealthy districts within Russian cities, most especially Moscow and St. Petersburg. And when young Russians went there for work or study, they realized very quickly that they quite liked wearing designer clothes, mm -hmm. having iPhones, and running water. And they didn't particularly want to return to their hometown where the likelihood of having an indoor toilet decreases significantly the further from Moscow you are. Nor Yay. did they particularly want to live a life where even with a full-time engineering job, rent in Moscow is on average 90% to your paycheck, or about $900 a month, which means most have to take on flatmates to make ends meet. Or nope. you could move to the West, where you could have all of those things, plus more, plus your own apartment, which you could afford with your significantly higher wage, plus an indoor toilet, plus running water all year. This is why in the mid-2000s, the West experienced a mass Russian migration, especially in countries like Germany. It's also why, when it comes to things like electronic components, heavy machinery, and even pharmaceuticals, Russia is still heavily dependent on Western imports. What that meant okay. is when Euro were designing their new tank, they did not exactly have a huge pool of expertise to rely on, which is why they probably went for an engine which already existed rather than try to develop one of 
of their own, believing that modifying the existing design to suit their needs would be far easier, even if it meant putting a Nazi machine inside a Russian tank, as it paraded through Red Square on the day celebrating Russia's victory over Germany in World War II. It is perhaps for this reason that when the T-14 was first seen during a rehearsal for the Red Square parade through Moscow, it broke down. <laughs> This is, this is sad. I'm sad. Are you guys sad? I'm definitely sad. This is not, this is not good. <laughs> God, I, no, oh, I knew, mm, let, okay. Using the crap in it as the base doesn't help your case at all. No, no, Rayo, it does not. It really doesn't. It, it, it's, why is, Yes! The irony! Oh god, this is so bad. The sheer centrifugal force of Stalin spinning in his grave caused reality to crack around the tank, because there is no force on Earth that can contain such irony. Or perhaps it was because they famously put an unreliable engine into a 56-ton vehicle and then Pikachu'd face when it turned out to be unreliable. <laughs> Let me know in the comments which one you think it is. But for whatever reason, Euro were convinced that they could fix the engine's problems by 2015. Well, they at least made it spin. At least they got it to spin, damn it! At least the fucking thing spins! They didn't. They then said they could have it done by Look 2017. Look at it spinning! They didn't. They then claimed it would be done by 2020. It wasn't. It's now 2023, and nine years of development time later, those engine problems have still not been fixed. You'd think, of course, the easier solution would be to simply fit the proven V2 engines from the T90s temporarily into the T14s, allowing them to, okay, maybe not operate at maximum efficiency, but at least get them to move without breaking down. The problem is, the V2 engine does not fit into the T14. Neither does any other engine. As I said earlier, the T-14 was built around the engine. Specifically, that engine. Nothing else fits, and getting anything else to fit would require extensive modifications to the vehicle, which would mean changing the design, which would be very expensive. But while we're here, I want to talk about the actual design of the vehicle, because there's something here- This is so fucking stupid. ...here that bothers me, and I'm annoyed it isn't bothering anyone else, so I want to explain. Go for it. What is this? Now, I could talk about how, in spite of the specifications for a tank with a low profile that's lighter and faster than its predecessor, the T90, the T14 is considerably larger, about 20 tons heavier, and though it claims a top speed of almost 50 miles an hour, no one has actually seen the Armata go 50 miles an hour. Right. And yes, that includes you. I mean, people look at T-90s flying down the road and go, wow, the speed. But keep in mind, those tanks are going 30 miles an hour. Right. That's what 30 miles an hour looks like. Speed can be very hard to judge, True. especially when you're looking at a larger vehicle like a tank, especially when it's been filmed by a propaganda camera that's using a bunch of neat little tricks to fool your eyes into thinking that what you're looking at is far more impressive than it actually is. And no, it's not just Russia that do this. This is what 50 miles an hour looks like. <laughs> you see the difference. But that's not what annoys me. I could talk about the tank's interior. That uh -huh. armored coffin, as it's called, confuses me, as every time I've seen it, something changes. These hatches are clearly manually operated, but in Zvesta's documentary on the T-14, they are hydraulically sealed? Wait, what? Do you want to be hydraulically sealed into a tank? No! Hydraulics which can typically fail and are known to explode quite violently when hit by, let's say, I don't know, an anti-tank round? He Look at those expressions. Look at these expressions. The guy on the left has done resigned his fate. His wife left him the, like the day before, and he's done this resigned his fate. The guy in the center, he has a lot to live for, but he doesn't think he's going to be living that much longer. And the guy on the end is so high he can't even contain it. Heck, even in the documentary, though the background sounds are being muted, you can tell how loud the interior is, even while the tank is at idle. Equipage занял свою позицию. Мне сейчас досталось место командира. Вы слышите? The AC unit. Это кондиционер, кстати. 
For the longest time, I genuinely thought the driver couldn't see. When interior photos of the Armata became available, this was the driver's view, but it turns out he's got periscopes behind him. That is his only way of seeing, which is fine if you were designing a tank built in the 80s or 90s, but in the West, periscopes are now being seen more as a backup sight rather than a main. Periscopes are fragile. Regardless of how strong you make the glass, it's still glass. Right. So more modern tanks are built with small optical cameras and screens being the primary sight, with the periscopes acting as backups, which can be retracted down into the hull during combat if they aren't needed. On the Armata, all the fancy touchscreen technology the other positions have, the driver does not. He's essentially just looking out of a window. And for comparison, this is the driver's position of the KF-51 Panther. Second to that point, uh -huh. the gunner does not have a backup sight. Tanks like the Abrams, the Leopard, and even the Challenger all have backup sights to the main gun, meaning if those sights are compromised, the gun can still be fired. The Armata cannot. But hey, at least the gunner has a periscope so he can see forward, for no particular reason. The same is true of the commander's sight. If his electronic sights go down, like the others, he has no backup sight, other than the three periscopes in front of him, meaning he cannot see behind him and now has to shout directions at the driver. Sweet! And now you're starting to see the problems with crewless turrets. The other issue, of course, that's probably been covered to death by now, is there does not seem to be a way for the crew to access the turret internally, potentially meaning if that gun jams, it has to return to the depot, or at least its forward operating base to clear it, something that would take the crew of an Abrams less than 30 seconds to fix. And for that, there isn't really much benefit. The autoloader can apparently reload each round in around 10 seconds, which makes it slower than both the T-80 and T-72 respectively, and considerably slower than the Abrams, of which the qualifying time for a loader to pass training is 7 seconds, and the best crews claim they can reload in about 4-5 to five seconds, meaning a good Abrams can fire twice before the T-14 has reloaded. Nice. And it gets worse. Pro-Ukrainian hackers found that most of the electronic systems on board, including the digital sights, the night vision, the infrared, were all in fact Western imports. Most notably, these were last generation French optics from the Leclerc MBT, left over from when they were all upgraded to Icon in 2009. These optics are, how can I put this, available to the public. And they're not even the best that are currently available. If you've got a spare five grand, you can go into any high-end spy gadget store and buy a drone that will give you better night vision and IR tracking capabilities than the latest generation of modern Russian tanks. Again, what were they thinking? Why did they build this? And it gets worse, because the Chinese were once interested in buying the T-14, and according to their own media, which is usually fairly pro-Russian, according to the Chinese, the tank was in Syria, but did not see any combat. The if this shit was written about a story, I wouldn't believe it. If I read this in a novel, I wouldn't believe it. Because there gets to be a point... There, there gets to be a, a point where you're just sitting there like, okay, this has got to be horseshit. There's, like, at this point, they're just trying to make this character look bad because, for the love of God, there's just no way. They're just trying to make this character look bad. But then you realize this is an actual thing. This is an actual fucking thing. And it just gets more and more frustrating. Uh, this is... It, it, it's hurting my feelings because a modern nation built this. Even if the modern nation is Russia. And everybody thought this was a good idea. Let's go. The rumor that their government was planning to purchase the T-14 almost became a major scandal in China. Chinese media blasted the tank because according to a report they published to the media, none of the tank's defense systems actually worked. The soft kill defense systems were simply smoke screens, and the hard kill systems designed specifically to stop the Javelin and the tow missile could not detect if either of these systems had been fired at the tank, and relied entirely on the crew being able to notice a missile traveling at the speed of sound flying towards them. And to what? the fuck? Top it off, there was no evidence of the supposed electronic warfare systems that could render guided missiles and mines inert. The report concluded that Russia was purposely lying about the capabilities of the tank, and it couldn't actually do any of what it claimed. China said this. China! China! China. And we're not even at the part that makes me mad yet. The part and by the way, guys, if you're worried about China, you need to stop worrying, okay? Go look at the... I... I, I I'm trying to remember what they call the name of the construction 
that they have in China where the buildings are literally falling the fuck apart just because they're trying to spend money into real estate. Part that truly makes me mad is the part no one is. I don't care if they have three telescopes. They could have 20 damn things. They're not going to see a fucking missile. Talking about its modular design. I think because the idea of modular design and standardization is such a positive buzzword to people and the image of efficiency and cost saving that it conjures up, that no one Tofu has really Drake. questioned Thank you, Michael. why you'd even want this. In the case of the T-14, the tank is built with the idea that the chassis, that's this lower part with the wheels in it, can be used on an entire family of vehicles. Some examples have included anti-air vehicles and infantry fighting vehicles. Now, go ahead, fucker. You can't even get the engine to work right! This is not, in theory, a bad this idea. This is so Standardization stupid! Standardization and modularity like this is fairly common, especially in the military. It was one of the major strengths of the M113. It was the core design philosophy of the British Army in the 70s, and even the modern, highly publicized HIMAR systems is part of a family of vehicles which all use the same basic structure. So if you ask any idiot about- Yeah, but it works! That's the difference! That's the fucking difference! The engine fucking works! standardization and modularity in military vehicles, they are obviously going to tell you it's a good thing. In fact, they may even tell you that the fact the T-14 can do this and our tanks can't show that the Russians are, oh, they're just always one step ahead of us with stuff like this. But here's the thing, and the examples of modular designs I just gave you, those are all light vehicles. And there's a reason for that. Right! Let's take our M113 since it's the easiest example. This is a lightweight APC, but we can modify it without much effort to turn it into a mortar carrier or an anti-air variant or whatever this is. <laughs> Point is, all these vehicles are sort of backline vehicles. An artillery tractor or a mortar carrier or, or hell, this thing is going to be way behind the lines. Mm -hmm. So why does it need to be armored? The same goes with anti-air vehicles, they're going to be nowhere near the front lines, and they're really designed to just throw missiles at planes from a long way away. Why does it need to be armoured? Besides right. that this is armoured, it can compromise. It's not like it's gonna matter either. Speed, and more importantly, fuel consumption. And there's this thing in war we call logistics. Yes! Fuel is expensive and hard to transport. The trucks that do it are often very distinct and are a priority target for anyone behind enemy lines looking to disrupt supplies. True. And fuel depots, as a rule, tend to be very explosive. So you don't really want a lot of them lying around. Nor do you want a gigantic one that your enemy is going to instantly target with everything that it has. Now, tanks are thirsty. They take up a lot of fuel and need that fuel in constant supply to keep doing what they do. If your tank runs out of fuel, they can't fight, and they basically become a sitting duck. So in sure. order to alleviate that problem, it's beneficial if everything else in your army requires as little fuel as possible. So the tanks always have what they need, so things that don't need to be armoured typically aren't. The only exception is something like an infantry fighting vehicle or other vehicles that you expect to see frontline combat, but those remain lightly armoured because they only need to protect the troops inside from small arms fire, right. mortars and improvised explosives. Speed and maneuverability is how you survive as an IFV, True. not tanking hits with your armour. That's the job of tanks. Because the thing is, if everything in your army is also a tank with just a different turret, then everything you have is an armoured fuel hungry monster, including things that don't need to be, and this is a problem the Russians have continued to be plagued by. Things like the BMP and the various support vehicles which use them as a base are all built on a tank chassis that share the same V2 engine as most Russian tanks, which means it's a thirsty, thirsty boy. Now Russia has absolute shitloads of fuel and never once considered that running out of fuel would ever be an issue, until it realised that getting all that fuel to the front line was going to be a bit of a problem. In the early days of the Ukraine war, a huge number of Russia's tank fleet was abandoned because the tanks just ran out of fuel. When I heard this, when when this came over the news, <coughs> and I watched this for the first time, I, I legitimately lost my mind. I legitimately lost my damn mind. Like, how in the hell did you... Who fucks up like this? Who fucks up like this? This is beyond mind-numbing. Russia had the fuel, but they just couldn't get it to the front lines. It's not like Ukraine is across the fucking country, is across the goddamn continent. You literally fall across the border and you're in Ukraine. You can't tell me you can't get a gas truck from point A to point B when point A to point B is a straight drive down the interstate. 
Get the fuck out of here! And even now, fuel remains a major issue, because the Ukrainians behind the line are prioritizing the destruction of fuel trucks, so much that the Russians have started to try and disguise them. They also can't store all the fuel they need in one location close to the front line, so it's always readily available, because that just tempts the high Mars of fate. Yeah. And the T-14 family of vehicles really does nothing to alleviate that problem. The infantry fighting vehicle variant of the T-14 family, the T-15, weighs 48 tons. That's almost twice as heavy as the Bradley, yet offers no greater protection or troop capacity. And the same goes for the S-235 SPG, also based on the tank chassis, this time the T-90, something that is designed to operate well behind the lines, fire several highly accurate artillery shots, and then move quickly before counter-battery can hit home. Why does it need to be armoured? Things like the Paladin or the AS-90 may look armoured, but in reality they're not. They're rated for shrapnel and small arms fire, a grenade can penetrate the hull, because anything more armoured is just a waste of fuel. And right. it's not about how much fuel you have, it's about getting it where it needs to go. And how many more fuel trucks are you going to have to send down the road if your entire army of vehicles is built on the chassis of a heavily armoured tank? And I'm not just talking IIVs here, it's engineer vehicles, it's bridge layers, it's radar vehicles for anti-air sites, it's mortar carriers, it's ambulances, it's a fuel-intensive fleet they are proposing. And the more fuel trucks you need to supply that fleet, the bigger a target they become, and the more units you need to pull off the reserve to escort those convoys, which means the less stuff you have on hand for your major offensive. This is why in the West, with perhaps the exclusion of engineer vehicles because they are expected to drive into combat zones and drag tanks out of it while presumably under fire, the majority of modular vehicles tend to be based on infantry fighting vehicles like the CV-90, which are lightly armoured with the option of removing that armour for things that don't need it, or adding more for things that do. Because as that great Chinese philosopher said in that book that everyone won't shut up about, an army marches on its stomach. Fly away in my space rocket. You no need put money in my pocket. What? The door is closed, I just lock it. I put my car plug in your socket. You put what? No. There's this cute little story about another Russian tank called the IS-3. The story goes that the first time the West laid eyes on the IS-3 was during the victory parade through Berlin at the end of World War II. Okay. And after politely allowing the Americans and then the British to go first, the Russians then follow with their T-34s and hundreds and hundreds of IS-3s. The sheer sight of so many advanced heavy tanks made British General Bernard Montgomery actively gasp and shock, which prompted American General Patton to lean over and proclaim, don't worry, we're still on your side. It's a fun little story which encapsulates the narrative of the tank that shocked the West, and no one can really talk about the IS-3 without bringing that story up, and as you probably yeah. guessed by now, it never happened. There was actually several victory parades through Berlin. Russia and Britain had one each, followed by a joint one with America and Britain, and then a final parade with Britain, America, and Russia. This was okay. the parade in which the IS-3s were shown. Now, Patton never attended this parade, and by the time the Russians were featured, Montgomery had already left. <laughs> the story of the tank that shocked the West was made completely up by Russian propaganda, and it is a line that has been repeated about every Russian tank ever made. It even made True. its way retroactively into the T-34 mythos. It's True. the tank that shocked the Germans, even though it did nothing of the sort. But it is a line that's repeated almost consistently, that the West is always shocked by this idea that Russia is somehow able to produce a better tank than the one it made previously. This is a narrative which drives almost everything in Russia. It's called Smikalka. I mean, there's no direct translation, but roughly it means innovation. Huh. But innovation exclusive to Russia. It's a huge part of Russian culture, and the narrative of it is driven in almost every aspect of absolutely everything the average Russian is exposed to in life, much in the same way the average American might approach the ideas of freedom or liberty. And while some Americans believe that only America is the land of the free, some Russians believe that only Russia and only pure-blooded Russians are capable of smikalka, the idea that they, and they alone, are capable of finding creative and innovative solutions to problems that just no one else would ever think of. To give you okay. an example of Smikalka, right now Russian children are in school building trench candles and packing them off to the front lines for their soldiers. This is celebrated in Russian culture because only the Russian mind would think of making candles to compensate for the fact that their troops cannot use electric lights because that makes them easy targets for Ukrainian drones and 
snipers. And this is encouraged by the government because it distracts from the fact that it's 2023 and Russia is digging trenches. We look at Russian trucks with this weird improvised armor, the ridiculous cope cages, uh -huh. the disguised fuel trucks, or the abomination, and see a nation that- <laughs> What is the abomination? is struggling to cope with the reality of its situation and grasping with ever-increasing desperation at increasingly bizarre ideas to delay the inevitable. But to Russia, it's Mikhailka, and it's genius. To them, Russia, and only Russia, is capable of innovation like this, unlike in the West, where the uncreative and simple-minded American can't think of innovative ways to fix problems, so they throw billions of dollars into projects, hoping technology will fix that problem for them. The Russian adapts and innovates, whereas the American buys yet another convenience. Which is why Russian propaganda has always instilled this idea that Western armies are just too expensive to work and overly right. reliant on un proven technology. Christ, no wonder Russia today liked pure spray. And in a kind of weird way, the T-14 somewhat represents that ideology. Almost all the footage we have of the T-14 comes from this documentary by Zvezda, a Russian TV network. Okay. They've done these documentaries called Combat Approved on almost every Russian tank, and they are rather famed in the military analyst community for their somewhat overdramatic presentation and the narrator that they use for Western translations, which... Well, I'll just let you hear it. Okay. About the most advanced Russian weapons, the people who create them, and those specialists who use their access to secret documents to control the most important, and therefore, the most secret military projects of the country every day. Wait, there's a YouTuber that sounds like this guy, and I, I can't watch him. I can't watch him. He has, like, legitimately the most annoying voice I've ever heard in my life. Like, legitimately. It actually hurts my feelings to listen to this guy. Mmm, doesn't that get your manly balls tingling? No. At the start of the T14 documentary, the host goes on this spiel about how this documentary will be copied and shown to people in the Pentagon, and the CIA will be pouring over every second of it. It does amusing little things like blur out the interior of the tank before showing it unblurred. I, I I have such a fucking headache now. Matt Storm, he does sound like a functional alcoholic. You, you're not kidding. Even AI voices sound better. Enter carry, you're not kidding. Slacker, this is just stupid. Mere minutes later, blur out the screens and then just unblur them mere minutes later and show massive classified signs over the engine in spite of the name and specs of this engine being publicly available. But nothing, nothing on the Amata is new. And yet the host treats everything, every simple innovation, such as the T-15 having space for two people to walk past each Yeah. Yeah. Each other while dismounting or just having a phone on the back of it. To the T-14's turret being able to track a target without input from the gunner. So it has a phone on the back of it. Congratulations. We have cell phones now! Something tanks have been able to do since the 1960s to just being able to rotate 360 degrees while standing still. They want a transport that doesn't carry men and a scout that's got a cannon as big as a tank's on it. And portholes. Oh, great! Portholes. So the guys can shoot out whatever they can't hit with their cannon. As all things that only Russian tanks are capable of. All this classified bullshit, all the blurring out, the CIA rant at the start, this is all just window dressing for yeah. the benefit of the Russian public. They need them and they need the Vatniks to believe that only Russia is capable of such innovation because it distracts from the reality that this tank is just nothing special. There's even a little dig at the Abrams and the Leopard claiming these tanks are 50 years behind the Russians because they don't have autoloaders. Well, the French Leclerc is obviously the most advanced Western tank in the world because it does. We should remind you here that the American Abrams, German Leopard, and Israeli Merkava do not have this loader. All this time, Western designers insisted that this was an unnecessary device. And then, such a device suddenly appears on the most advanced NATO tank, the Leclerc. So, the West is about 50 years behind us in this regard. The sh <laughs> oh, 
god. This is like... That that announcer guy is the equivalent of dick pills, okay? He is the equivalent of dick pills. <laughs> so, just... The show ends with a proclamation from Gero's deputy CEO that they, and by they he means the West, will be playing catch up for the next 15 years and then smirks like a turtle enjoying the smell of his own farts. But is that true? Are Western tanks now outdated and can only play catch up with whatever Russia builds? Well I mean if you've gotten this far in the video and still think that then obviously you weren't paying attention but I'll humour you. Long ago and far away, in the more hobbyist part of the military analyst community, until a That's number good. of these were earmarked for transfer to Ukraine of course, the British Challenger 2 was often cited as one of the worst tanks in NATO service, okay. mostly due to its performance in a game that I shouldn't probably be mentioning in a video sponsored by World of Warships. The major problem with the Challenger in games like that is its gun, it's rifled, which allows for greater accuracy over longer ranges, but that comes at the cost of not being able to use the more modern and more powerful NATO anti-tank rounds, making it weaker to more modern tanks. Okay. The Challenger uses Hesh rounds to compensate for this, which most video games famously do not model particularly well, and this is the Challenger's biggest downfall. For all its faults, the T-14 is theoretically well protected against Hesh rounds, and the okay. lower velocity of these rounds make them more vulnerable to hard kill systems. So theoretically, the Challenger is outdated by the T-14, but in reality, the war the Challengers were built to fight were not with Russia. The British envisioned that the only tanks the Challenger would ever have to face were export models of the T-72s and old T-55s, right. both of which it has proven to be highly capable against. The Brits wanted a low maintenance tank built for taking on hordes of outdated armour in use by despot dictators <laughs> that was agile over rough ground, could fire the more effective high explosive rounds, and was largely immune to anti-tank infantry weapons that a third world nation could realistically buy. Okay. And that's pretty much what they got. But if Britain ever expected to fight the T-14, what are their options? Well, for one, they just put a different gun on it because they're just wait for it to break down. I mean, shit, at that point, that's what I'd do. There is a version of the Challenger 2 which uses a smoothbore cannon and can use the same ammunition as both the Germans and the Americans. Okay. It's called the Challenger Clip and it's been available since 2006. In the long term, there are a number of proposed upgrade packages to the Challenger, coined under the umbrella term of HAAIP. These include more powerful engines, better suspensions, updated sights, electronic warfare packages, soft and hard kill systems, new turret systems, and even a vastly improved armor system, which can allegedly protect the tank against multiple hits from more modern NATO rounds. These systems started development in 2005. In 2014, they were announced to the public at around the same time the Armata was announced, and in 2016, the contracts were were awarded. This work bounced back and forth as stuff in Britain typically does, and in 2021 specifications for what these upgrades would be were finally agreed on, and the project was named Challenger 3. Almost all the updates on the Challenger 3 are nothing new. They've been okay. available as upgrade packages to the Challenger 2 since 2016. Challenger 3 acts largely as a refinement and optimization of those upgrades. It took the Brits, a country with a massively underfunded weapons development program, two years to surpass the amount and that's the Yamata at its theoretical strength, not its actual. And by <laughs> 2030, Britain will have over 100 of these new tanks. Oh, okay. How many T-14s will Russia have? As for the rest of the world, the KF-51 Panther blows everything the Amata is out of the water, with its 130mm cannon, drone reconnaissance system, and augmented reality interface. It's even capable of data link, which means a drone hovering over the battlefield can provide targeting solutions to the gunner, even if the tank cannot see the target. That's right, the Panther can effectively wall hack. And all of these systems are not new, unproven, expensive technologies. Right. They would have been back in the 2000s, but 20 years of development later and they are pretty solid and reliable systems. This is the tank that Ukraine has chosen to be its main battle tank in the post-war world. Operational readiness is expected around September 2024, but this is pretty optimistic. Okay, and then yeah, America gave us the Abrams X. The 
Abram's ex seems to be a direct challenge to Ural, in that it is everything the Amata is pretending to be but actually real, and on the <laughs> chassis of an Abrams. The ex features an autoloader, a crewless turret, and has a sensor system that gives the crew a full 360 degree awareness, which is completely unheard of in a tank. It can also fire loitering munitions with a 25 mile range, and features a hybrid diesel electric engine which allows the tank to go into silent mode, making almost no noise when it moves. And combined with the rumoured anti-thermal infrared systems developed by BAA back in 2009, that would mean that this tank, at night, is practically invisible, especially to a country reliant on second generation thermal optics. America! Fuck yeah! Okay. I'm kidding, guys. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Rex walks in with complete boss. Thank you, Alistar. I fear no man, but that thing scares me. I feel the same way about the hospitaler, my guy. I feel the same way about the hospitaler. If I had heard this story about anything else, if I had heard this story about this tank, the T-14, I wouldn't have believed it. I would, I would think there's no way that there's no damned way you managed to you managed to fuck this up this bad. But they did. The second that I saw that Ukrainians were capturing tanks and like they were literally going up to the tanks, cutting open those little stupid little panels and finding cardboard inside. Yeah. Thank you, Alistar Bowman. I really appreciate it, bud. Russia be yeah. This tank fucking terrifies me. Yeah. I'm so glad it's on my side. But the Abrams X is sadly just a demonstration vehicle. It's there to prove what could be done if we shut down a few schools and gave the money to General Dynamics instead. The reason the Abrams- Yeah, but do we need to? Abrams X and the Panther aren't largely being accepted into service just yet. The reason the Challenger 3 is taking so long to deliver is quite simple. These tanks just don't need to exist yet. While the press, the occasional defense commentator who was around to be paid to give a quote, various YouTubers, and the general defense analyst hobbyist crowd creamed their pants over the Amata, and all the propaganda that Russia farted out about it, and every defense company around the world trying to use it as justification for yet another budget inflation, the experts were not concerned. And the time it has taken Ural to not fix the Amata's <laughs> engine problems, the West has already surpassed it as a design. By the time the Amata actually enters service, it will already be outdated. Well, I wonder who wound up in the gulag. The Armata is not some new standard for armored warfare. Everything the Armata is has been done before, and in many cases has been done better. The revolutionary new technology found on the Armata has equivalents that can be purchased on the domestic market, which is why the tank has earned the nickname the AliExpress tank. Quite frankly, the Armata is seen as a bit of a joke. And all it has proved is that it is not the world that needs to play catch up with Russia, it's Russia that needs to play catch up to everyone else. And though this video is about the T-14, I honestly think nothing says this more than the Su-75, what Russia wants us to call the checkmate, that we refer to as the Femboy. Because like the Femboy, <laughs> it's attention-seeking, figuratively useless, and reeks of desperation. But I'd still do the sex with it. Everything about it, the marketing, even the name Checkmate, is a desperate cry for validation. Yes. It's Russia trying to prove to the world that it can build an equal to one of the most advanced fighter jets in the world, and anyone who speaks of the Femboy can't go five minutes without trying to compare it to the F-35. But by the end of this year, 612 F-35s will be in service across various NATO countries. Okay. The Su-75 is yet to make its first flight. The one they showed off at Max Air Show in 2021 was just a wooden mock-up, and even then there is no guarantee they will ever be able to build one because- What? Yeah, Russian people feel good about ourselves. Um, we can we can fight the West on anything. Here's a piece of wood to demonstrate. What the fuck? What? What? It's like the T14. This thing. Really oh God! This is why. This is why the aliens won't talk to us, man. Ah. Oh. I didn't know the entirety of the Russian military complex was a guy who takes a Jaguar sticker and puts it 
on a Honda CRX. Okay, that's essentially what we're doing here relied entirely on Western imports to build. Western imports which have now been cut off thanks to Russia's little eagle crusade in Ukraine. And if anything, the war in Ukraine has proved just how far the apple has fallen from the tree for Russia. The United States are mass producing an aircraft that can fly in all weathers, see in the dark, and is invisible to radar. The Russians are welding an 80-year-old gun to a 70-year-old APC. So for all its posturing and boasting, I think the Russia strong illusion has finally been broken. Russia is not an equal to the United States and NATO, it's an equal to North Korea, both technologically backwards nations with a large central city that it likes to pretend is the standard for life within its borders, both acting like cartoonish Saturday morning villains on the world stage, both with leaders its population worship almost like a god, a population that has been deluded into thinking their country is the best and everyone else is jealous of them, and both constantly biting for America's attention by constantly proclaiming grand military prowess projects that they fail to deliver on or are never as good as the propaganda claims. Bo that is the harshest claim I have heard in quite some time. Thank you James Ross, we can see you die a little each time. I am dying inside. They, um, I really do appreciate it Prince Adel Armoroth. If there's anything you should get out of this video, my guy, it's that if Russia boasts about anything, it's probably bullshit in one way or the other. Love your vids, been watching for the last year. Thank you, bud. I really do appreciate it. No, it's just like, why? It's like, it's true. It's true. It's like, why? Oh, my God. So, when I got out of the military in 2008, I knew a lot more than before I went in, and I didn't fall for the... You know, because what we have in the States here is we have sensationalist media. We don't have, the the age of informed media is just done, okay? These days we have sensationalist media. We don't, they want to, they want to generate views. They want to generate all the other kind of stuff. Well, so they just literally sit there and just crank out stories about how dangerous XYZ is. I'm like, fucking hello. Like, don't... Don't worry about, I was telling my dad, don't worry about Russia. Don't worry about Russia. They're a paper tiger. They're worse than a paper tiger. At least a paper tiger still had, can give you a paper cut. But they can't do that. Oh, God. I really do, like, Alistair Bowman, James Frost, Prince of Dole, I'm, I really, really appreciate it. You guys don't know how much. You love you, you love to see Putin's sins cry about the reality of the Russian military. It's sad, dude. It's sad. It's very it's unrelentingly sad. Because what winds up happening is these 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 people that are in th these powerful people in this country are making these decisions. Like, did you did anybody else see the video? Because it was it was videoed several times where they would go up to these the supposedly advanced armor uh, armor packages that were putting on the uh, Russian tanks, and they were cutting them open. It was just cardboard inside, because the people in charge of that particular issue was just pocketing the money, and the tank crew the tank crews be damned. This, oh my god. Oh my god. Both constantly engaging in Potemkin style training displays that are only impressive to people who have no idea how war works. Right. The only people who are impressed by shit like the T-14 are the same people who look at ranks of Chinese soldiers and then run to their Twitter to own the libs by telling everyone that the new they them army gender neutral Abrams X series with its hard kill defense laser and drone scouting equipment is no match for this decades upgrade package to the true rugged and reliable and Oh, so manly, T-72. <laughs> I'm going to try and wrap up here because I've ranted a lot and this was supposed to be a short video. Nothing about the T-14 suggests that any of the issues I've highlighted here couldn't be fixed. Theoretically, this could be a very interesting tank, it could be a very powerful tank, and a very interesting and fresh new way for Russia to consider its military planning. But the problem is, it was built in Russia. T-14 is stuck in what I like to call shop demonstration mode. Right. It's full of interesting new ideas with a lot of potential, but none of these ideas have been fully realized. 
Everything that was thrown onto the tank sounds amazing in theory, but no one really took that step back and asked what would happen if the tank were to seek combat. The reason Western tanks have backups and backups to those backups is because, well, they're tanks. They've seen a lot of combat too. They're expected to see combat, and in combat, things inevitably get damaged. At some point, you are going to lose power. Your sights will get damaged, your True. gun will get jammed, and then what? A damaged Abrams can keep fighting, granted not as efficiently, and its top priority would probably be to get the hell out of Dodge, right. but it can do it. The Armata can't. If it were to come face to face with, I'll pull an example at my ass, a Bradley, unless it gets that first shot off and destroys the Bradley before it can react, that Bradley is going to turn its auto cannon directly onto the sights of the Armata in a tactic that Bradley crews train for called buttoning. And if the Armata loses that sight, it can't fire. If it needs to reverse, it can't see behind it. And if it loses sight of the Bradley who fires a tow missile at it, then its hard kill system is functionally useless. But these are all flaws that any rigorous testing would flag. All of it could be forgiven if what we were seeing was just a prototype, but it's not. This is supposed to be the final production model, so the suggestion that the Armata still hasn't had any of those issues fixed, including its engine problems, since its debut in 2015 shows it probably never will. The brain drain of Russia has sapped it of a great deal of talent, and the fact that Ural is now 85 billion rubles in debt and has to cut the pay of its workers by 21% shows that the only talent they are likely to attract are people with nowhere else to go. Putinism and Russian corruption have also played huge parts in the downfall of the Yamata. A new engine was supposed to be built completely by scratch by Trilobe called the Seagull engine, which was supposed to be finished in 2017 and then again in 2019, but was never finished. Okay. And there's no real evidence it was ever worked on. Lovely. Why? We're not sure. I have a theory. The T-14 is not mass-produced. It was supposed to be, but the tanks are still being built by hand, like coach-built luxury cars. Which though this conjures an image of sophistication and craftsmanship in the mind of the common idiot, these are not custom-made cars with handcrafted details made by the finest craftsmen in the land. These are tanks handcrafted by underpaid low-skilled workers, <laughs> which rather explains the conditions some of them are in. The assembly oh line was God. funded, but never built. Why? Because the entire 64 million rubles set aside to build it was stolen by Dramichi Gerismanko, who happens to be of Ukrainian birth. Ah! I wonder what motivated him. In 2022 alone, over 60 defense officials and 250 public procurement officials, many with connections to the T-14 project, were prosecuted for embezzling state funds. I the black it. hole budget of 6.2 billion rubles and a population who genuinely thought a war of the degree fought in Ukraine was just going to be a fact to say there was no motivation to really deliver a working system. All the T-14 had to be was a propaganda piece proving that the My great Russian God. bear still had teeth to show that Russia was a modern like and powerful nation that was capable of competing with and surpassing Western nations. So they became just another money pit to fund the secret bank accounts of Russia's defense contractors and generals. And like the felon, the checkmate, the terminator, and many other projects Russia developed during this time, they did exactly what they had been designed to do. Look pretty and do nothing. And like its predecessor, the T-95, the T-14, as described by Russian propaganda, just doesn't exist. I have nothing. Um, they are tired of watching you will be Empire stomping on the country. Yeah, no kidding. Guys, X in chat if you enjoyed this. Y in chat if you don't know what the hell you just watched. And Z in chat if you think that this is the dumbest thing that you've seen inside of like, I don't know, 10 years. This has got to be. Yeah, Indigo. This has got to be the dumbest, dumbest, dumbest thing I've seen. Truth is stranger than fiction, okay? Truth is rabidly stranger than fiction. No! You cannot have a baby camel! 
He has a part two to the fit. Yes, it's the one. It's the one at the end there. My God. Yeah, it is comedic, loyal calf. It, it, this is this is not. This is not the attitude that I expect to see out of a country that's trying to impress upon the rest of the world that it's a threat. This is the kind of crap that I expect, as George Carlin said, from an office temp with a bad attitude. This is what I expect. This is so, so, so stupid. It is so impressively dumb. We're not getting camels, woman! She comes into my ch she comes into the chat while I'm live streaming and tries to get everybody on her side. I don't understand why. Matt Storm, that is the absolute. That is so true. It's painful. Matt Storm said somehow the concept of a movie about sharks in a tornado eating people is less stupid. Somebody tell me that this this isn't this isn't a government that's trying to. I knew it was bad because I've, I've known for years the government, like the entire government of Russia is just massively corrupt, but good God. Why not get a camel though? Because if she gets one camel, she's going to want an emu. If she gets an emu, she's going to want an ostrich. She wants to, if she gets an ostrich, she's going to want a rhinoceros. And then I got to explain things to people. I will not buy Joe Rogan. I am not buying her a camel. I'm not buying her a camel. Yeah, like is is it something you expect from North Korea? And you've see, you guys see this every so often. They're gonna throw these big. When's the last time anybody in the U.S. saw a military parade like a real military parade? We had one in the past five years, and that was really it. I mean, that was where we actually showed the stuff that we had. We've had one in like five years. We haven't had anything major besides that. I'm not buying her a zebra. The pug queen wants a zoo. Yes, she does. She does. How much is a camel? I don't need to know because I'm not getting her one. Guys, thank you for joining me. If you had fun, hit the X button, leave a comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already. 60% of my... Ah! You're... No, I don't want an emu! I don't want an emu! Black Lorgar says, Boss, I found Starship Troopers with furries and the commander is a pug with Sergeant Slaughter mustache. God damn it. Why? What did I do? What did I do? No. Guys. Um, so. Before I head out. We might as well watch the response video. On, um. No, I'm not getting her cassowary. No, hell no, Sir Tortillas. Thank you, but I'm not getting her cassowary. Um. I got that vacation all next week. I'm going to be going fishing just about every day next week. It's going to be great. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to come home. I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be doing live streaming, stuff like that. I'm going to be, I'm basically going to be having fun, guys. I'm going to be having fun. I'm going to be doing some stuff that I really wanted to do for a bit. I don't know how I'm going to fill the days next, next week. I'm going to, I'm going to go from the exact opposite of everything I've had before where I didn't have no time. Now I'm going to have a lot of time, but cast war with a chainsaw. No, thank you. No, thank you. Um, catch a bass slacker I'll, I'll i'll specifically target a bass yes matt storm i expect you to agree i know this woman i know this woman i know what she'll do i know what she'll do copy bars are nice but i'm still not getting her one guys thank you for joining me i'm gonna head out from here i hope you had a good time we're gonna do this again soon all of Major Pig, Pig's links are in the description down below, including his World of Tanks thing. That ad was funny as hell. And, yeah. I'm out. Fun is illegal and we are wanted dead? No. Beat my record of catching a seagull out of midair with a fishing pole? I dare you. 
we don't have seagulls where I live, bro. We just don't. Maximum over hamster? Very true. A T-34 or a cassowary? A cassowary. Because at least you got a story to tell. Instead of a two-ton paper. Well, a 50-ton paperweight. Guys, I'm out. I'll catch you guys next time. The pig was funny.